Well, welcome to our video history program. Today our interview candidate is Dr. Robert Resnick, who has been a long-term obstetrician gynecologist here in the Southern California area. Well, we're going to start way back, Dr. Resnick, back at, at your beginning. And so I'd like to know where you were born. Well, that, that is a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in New Haven, Connecticut, as were my parents. Uh, and uh, you want the year to uh, how? No, we're not, we, we, we don't have to be quite that personal. <laughs> okay. But it is curious. You were born on the East Coast. Yeah. How did you end up spending most of your life here on the West Coast? Well, somebody gave me a job, so I came out. Actually, I was in New Haven for the first 22 years of my life. <clears throat> then in Cleveland in medical school, went back to New Haven for residency, and then started working my way out. I was in the Army in Washington, D.C., and fellowship in Denver. And then in 1974, uh, Sam Yen uh, was one of the first chairmen here, and he recruited me out here, and I've been here ever since. So as you were growing up, uh, how did you decide that uh, medicine was going to be a career you wanted to aspire? Couldn't do anything else. Uh, I wasn't good enough in baseball. My father uh, was a lawyer. My brother was a lawyer. I hated that. Uh, I, uh, uh, there was something about, I guess, biology and science that attracted me, and it was uh, sort of a process of elimination. I just sort of moved into that area. I don't remember ever having a specific uh, driving force. It's just something that appealed to me, so I didn't. Wasn't a mentor or somebody who sort of stimulated to go in that direction? No, not really. I had mentors after I started medical school, but I didn't really have an, two uncles who were uh, internists. Uh, and I guess th to some extent they were mentors, but I don't think they were the reasons that I went into medicine. It was just something that appealed to me, and I did it. I can't cite a specific... And so you went to, you were in Cleveland for medical school, I right, think you said? Right, at Western Reserve, Case, Case Western, Western Reserve. Yeah. And had you gone to undergraduate school in Cleveland? or? No, no, I went to Yale to undergraduate school, and then went to Cleveland for medical school, and then back to New Haven for my postgraduate training. And did you do fellowship training <clears throat> after, after your residency? Well, the Army first. We all were draftees then. Mm. And uh, I was at Walter Reed for two years. Uh, when War Warren Pato was the chief, hmm. as a matter of fact. And then I did my fellowship training at the University of Colorado. Uh, Ed Makowski was the chair uh, I of OBGYN yeah, at the yeah. time, and I was in their perinatal medicine division uh, with a, a brilliant fetal physiologist named Giacomo Meschia. Uh, Giacomo is still doing research in his late 80s. Oh, my goodness. And uh, Fred Battaglia, who was the chairman of pediatrics. So when you were uh, in medical school at Case Western, uh, I think I may have some ideas of people who may have been there with you. Oh, yes. How did, uh, what got you motivated to go into OBGYN? Well, that's interesting because one of my oldest and closest friends uh, and my mentor it was Ted Quilligan. And Ted was a young assistant professor at what was then Western Reserve when I was a medical student. We all had required research projects. <clears throat> I did mine with him, and uh, I was actually planning on a career in neurosurgery. And he talked me out of it and talked me into obstetrics and gynecology. And he then uh, mentored me and talked me into going into uh, what was then perinatal medicine. Of course, Ted was the first head of the perinatal or maternal fetal medicine board. <clears throat> and. Um, uh, he was the one who got me into it. Well, that's interesting because at that time I suspect there weren't many people choosing to subspecialize in obstetrics and gynecology. They were mostly doing general OBGYN. Well, the subspecialties had just begun. And so 72, 73? Right, in that, right at that time period. As a matter of fact, I was in the second class that took the boards. Uh, and I was in a fellowship program. None of the fellowship programs at the time were board certified. You just, you know, were kind of grandfathered in. And uh, I remember uh, finishing my oral boards when Ted Quilligan called me. He said, you know, <clears throat> now you're, when you, you're going to have to take maternal fetal medicine boards. I said, I'm 35 years old. I'm tired of being examined. 
I don't want to take any more tests. I don't think I'm going to do that. He said, you better do it. <laughs> he was right. <laughs> insightful. He, he was very he, insightful. You know, it's, it's amazing all the impact that Dr. Quilligan has had on so many people. We, you know, we've spoken to folks like Dan Michelle and, and Richard Paul, all of whom worked uh, or were influenced by Dr. Quilligan. Well, and, and it, it's, it's been such a great relationship because it was obviously a, <clears throat> a faculty member-student relationship uh, early on, but he has been to every one of our family events all over the country, and I to theirs as well. We uh, meet at least two or three times a year in Orange County for dinner. I just saw him a couple of weeks ago, and then he came down and played golf with me. Wow. So this has been, we've been friends for now 50 years, oh, close to 50 years. That's, that's really wonderful. Yeah. Now, when you finished your, your fellowship, you, started, you said you started to work your way across the country. Tell us about your, uh, well, okay. your this, travels here. Okay, well, I, <clears throat> I looked at three different places, uh, three opportunities. One was to go back to New Haven. One was to Birmingham, Alabama. And the other was here. This was a brand new medical school. There were no people, there was no one here doing perinatal medicine. And um, uh, Sam Yen was looking for someone to run his division. Uh, again, the medical school was about five years old. It was really in its infancy. And it looked like a terrific opportunity. And so we decided, well, let's do it. And we picked up our belongings in Denver and moved out to uh, California. Uh, all my family was still on the East Coast as well as my wife's. So it was uh, kind of a big move for us, big Real step. Real commitment, yeah. Yeah, it was a big commitment. But uh, we, uh, obviously, since we've never left. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, one of our questions is, say, well, where'd you go next? But I know you. once you came to San Diego, you've stayed here. Well, I, you know, I looked a couple of times, but uh, uh, nothing was better than where I was. And all, really, our lives are here now, all our friends. And my daughter's here uh, as an obstetrician gynecologist. And my son's in Denver. That's not far away. So we're, we've all moved out west. Well, you know, it's interesting, mm -hmm. too. Have, there aren't that many people who have stayed with in one department and led it for you know, literally decades. Uh, how have you seen your department, the, the great department here at UCSD, evolve? Well, you know, it, it's, it's really evolved, I think, in two phases. <clears throat> Our first two chairmen were Ken Ryan and Sam Yen. And these were individuals who were obviously very research-oriented. And in fact, UCSD was started uh, to be a research institution with clinical care really as an appendage. And uh, over the years uh, after Sam stepped down, I became department chair, and the, the movement at that point in the medical school was to begin to strengthen the clinical services. And uh, so that was really when the medical school started in 68, it's become a real dominant uh, medical care force in Southern California, and the clinical services have all expanded. So that's really been the evolution, and it's become a balanced department with uh, both basic science and clinical investigation and a very strong clinical wing as well. Do you have a lot of, how many, do you have a lot of fellowship programs within your residency? Yeah, in all four areas. Yeah, uh, all, uh, <clears throat> we have board certified programs in all areas. Yeah, how have you seen your involvement with ACOG? Should say board approved. Uh, right. <laughs> right. I understand. Well, three of them are board approved, and one's ACG and me approved. I guess. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah that's a new. Right. That's a new. That's a Thank new you. twist. Right. A new twist. Over these years, how have your how's your interaction in different roles with our college with ACOG? How has that uh, impacted your career? Oh, I think in a tremendously positive way, <clears throat> both in terms of the things that I've learned as well as the friends that I've made. That, those are the two things. Whatever I've been able to uh, uh, give back to the college is probably secondary in its value to what I've gotten from it. I think I, there have been a number of things, but I think probably the two major ones have been the service on the obstetrical practice committee uh, two different times, and then uh, the college representative on the residency review committee. Uh, but that 
those experiences and the individuals that I met through those college activities have been uh, invaluable. Really, yeah. it's, I think it's interesting, you know, working on some of those committees which are really hard working. I think the RRC may be the hardest working of all of them. Uh, it, the bonds you get with the different members who are there with you is really special. You really do, Hal, and, and there were a number of wonderful people from various, representing various organizations. Uh, uh, and they really have, they do a lot of hard work. We know, having led a, a major training program for the lengths of time that you have, how, have you, how do, you, do you see the evolution of training uh, in obstetrics and gynecology? Well, you know, it, it, I think that it's, it's interesting. I mean, the, obviously the evolution of training goes along with how the specialty itself has changed. And there have been, basically, there's hardly anything that I learned in residency that is still valid in terms of practice. Everything has changed. And we tell our residents all the time that you're, when they leave, your education is beginning, not ending. Uh, so much has changed. But I would say the, the, the evolution has been, in, it, for residents at least, in a movement toward uh, probably minimally invasive surgery, uh, a whole different approach to obstetrics than the uh, type of uh, training that we had, uh, a, uh, an approach to uh, pelvic floor dysfunction that's you know, now evidence-based and scientifically founded, uh, which it certainly wasn't uh, when I was a resident. And uh, uh, that's been it. The, the other change I'm not sure is for the best, and, and that is the, the amount of time that residents have mm -hmm. to train now yeah. has really decreased. And I think that that has been a, an overall detriment to the, uh, um, the, the graded responsibility that residents have. I think what concerns me the most about that evolution is that the chief resident seems to have become an appendage in many ways. And that role has been usurped by junior faculty and fellows. And I, I have some concerns about how well prepared they are to take responsibility when they finish residency. They certainly have a good fund of knowledge, but what are, I'm worried about what they're going to do at 3 o'clock in the morning with a real problem. They turn around and nobody's there. Yeah, I, to follow up on that, how do you, do, you, do you see a change in how these folks are practicing after when they go out? Do you think that's changing? Yes, I, I do think it's changing. The, the, um, their obstetrical practice, well, it's changed in a few ways. They've become very dependent on subspecialists. I think for a number of reasons, but uh, I think for certainly a security blanket as well as patient care. Uh, I think that, um, and I see this as well because I do consultations uh, part-time in a uh, uh, in a place that uh, in a, one of the private hospitals in the community that uses the UCSD faculty mm -hmm. for perinatal consults. And many of our graduates have gone there in a practice. They're not quite ready when they get out, and they lean on their senior partners. And it's like an it's like a, a an additional two to three year training period that they get uh, that they. Uh, to make up for what they missed in terms of their time spent in assuming responsibility during residency. I think, I think that's right. I mean, I saw that in, in programs back on the East Coast that, that, that I had been involved in. You know, throughout all of our careers, we always have some really positive things, but then we unfortunately have some that are not as positive. If you, if you had to look back and see what your most disappointing experience had been as an obstetrician gynecologist, what, what would you recall? Yeah, it, it, you know, first of all, like, keeping it positive, the vast majority have been positive experiences. But I look back uh, with, the, with this perspective of time, I'd say one is the change, the evolution in residency training uh, from that point of view. And the other is the cesarean section rate, uh, having gone to, uh, uh, the, the high numbers that it's that it has achieved, and I often think, uh, I wonder if I could or anyone could find 
any evidence-based data to show any improvement in maternal or infant outcome based on that incredible, uh, really logarithmic increase in cesarean section rate. And, uh, uh, and that has been a disappointment. I, I think we've, and now we're in a box, because we're, that, that, the genie is out of the, mm -hmm. out of the bottle, yeah. and it's not gonna go back in. Yeah, it's a, you know now as you as we're all aware. I mean, recent folks show that a young woman having her first pregnancy at term with a single vertex fetus has almost a 27 percent chance of having a cesarean section. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it is a very very changed uh, environment, and I agree. I don't I don't see it going back. But if we could change residency education, seeing how it's, it has evolved, if we if we had an opportunity of redirecting it, what sort of thoughts would you have on new directions? Well, there are two, one of which is not going to happen, and the other <laughs> could. <laughs> I think you know what I'm going to I get. think I do. <laughs> All right. I, I think that to try to, to teach the, the scope and breadth of this specialty, including the technical skills that are needed, in four years with the limited work hours that uh, and and to be able to to be able to see the things that residents need to see I mean, I've always felt that clinical medicine you didn't learn from a textbook you had to be soaked in it the more you saw the more you did the better you got at it and, it, and they're just not seeing and doing enough now that's not going to go back because the work mm -hmm. hours thing is not going to change it, the, the one thing that I would change, it comes back to the residency review experience, committee experience that I had, because when I was on the residency review committee is when we mandated uh, uh, coverage by faculty 24 hours a day. Uh, and, and the intent of that was for teaching, for patient safety, mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't meant to take over the role of the chief resident. And as I see that, both in our institution and any time I go to another institution, I hear the same thing over and over again. The, the, the fellows become the resident, uh, the chief resident, the junior faculty, and frequently they don't have the, uh, the, their own <coughs> self-confidence to be able to uh, leave the senior residents alone on the labor and delivery floor. And I think probably the same is true on the on the gynecology service, although I have limited exposure to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, it is interesting. I mean, we have seen over the last 10 years the development of a, a fourth approved or accredited subspecialty and some developments of some that are like pediatric and adolescence and infectious disease and minimally invasive uh, surgery. You know, do you see OBGYN getting more and more subspecialized? Uh, going going forward, I think probably so, uh, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I was wrong. I think we're always going to have I, among our own residents. We talked, and there's always there are always a number of them, most of them, probably the majority, who want to be able to take care of women and provide all the health care services possible for women. They want to do it all. Uh, some. Uh, are uh, more interested in doing uh, fellowship training, uh, but um, you know, I'm I'm really not sure how that will sort out. It, the college has probably studied that and has some uh, <laughs> ideas, better thoughts than well, I. We're did. thinking about it. Yeah. yeah, I was just sort of curious with from all your experience, what yeah. what your thoughts would be. Uh, I, I again, I think there's a cadre of people who really want to provide all the health services they can for women, uh, and others are committed to a subspecialty by the time they, at the, when they first start their training. Well, the, you know, the other interesting thing about it when, is some of the services that when you trained and I trained, we needed to provide some of the procedural services, we don't, aren't needed anymore. Well, that's true. Um, and uh, so what that total service package is, I think, is evolving. I, I would agree with that. And yeah. so how we're going to you know how we're going to fulfill all that is going to I, I think it's going to be going to be very very interesting. Uh, do you 
you know, another issue that we have had is, is how the gender change, I know your daughter, uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with, uh, is an obstetrician gynecologist. All right. How do you see us getting more men back into uh, OBGYN? It's going to be a tough sell. Uh, you know, as we talk about this all the time. I, f I find that w obviously women are drawn to the specialty for very obvious mm -hmm. reasons. And uh, a lot of women, I would think probably the majority, but definitely not all, not 90%, but certainly the younger women would prefer to see a, another woman for their health care. Uh, I don't know if the number is 50, 60, 80 percent or what, but that's when they don't have a problem. If they got a problem, they have a serious problem, they don't care who they see, they want it fixed. And I think that's probably why the men who are going into obstetrics and gynecology are more likely to go into the subspecialty areas. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, unfortunate woman with a malignant disease wants it cured. She doesn't care whether it's a man or a woman who does it as long as her problem is solved. The same is true with infertility, perinatal medicine, or anything else. So um, uh, probably through the expansion of uh, fellowship uh, training and maybe reaching out into medical schools and talking more about subspecialties in our field. Uh, that might be a way to attract men. Well, you know, it's interesting. Decades ago, Dr. Charlie Hunter, when he was on the board, did this thing about primary care. And primary care is almost sometimes viewed as a, a dirty word, I think, and, and by some obstetrician gynecologists. But when you were referring to, you know, being able to take real complete care of, of women, do you see an evolution, how do you see the evolution of OBGYN and ongoing women's wellness care? Well, I, I, in terms, at least if you're referring how to whether or not it will go beyond uh, uh, standard obstetrics and gynecologic care into more internal medicine or general practice aspects, which is what it looked like it might be doing 15 years or so mm -hmm. ago. I. I would think probably not because I don't think, I think if the general obstetrician gynecologist would have re really wanted to do that type of practice, they would have gone into family medicine or internal medicine. I don't think the majority of obstetrician gynecologists really want to provide that expanded care. I think they want to focus on problems specific to women uh, and specific to reproductive issues. Now, I, I know that you have at least semi-retired here. I don't know if you're fully retired here or not. And I'm just curious as to what your current activities are at UCSD. Well, i uh, working half-time. As a matter of fact, I came here today. I saw about 18 or 20 high-risk pregnancy consultations that's, today. That doesn't sound like retire. <laughs> it sounds like full-time. I'm exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I do that uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and I have a tea time at 1 o'clock. You might want to join me. Yeah, there, that's, right? a, that's a good idea. <laughs> right? That's a good idea. That's how I spend my time. I do no administrative work anymore, but I do do clinical investigation. I spend a lot of time with fellows. I, uh, uh, I direct our high-risk obstetrical clinic with fellows and residents. And uh, so the bulk of my time is spent uh, in patient, in teaching, but focused on patient care. And you have, and you have your fellows that work, rotate with you through your uh, high yes. risk of, yeah. for your clinic? Yeah. And, and uh, we have a fetal diagnosis and treatment center. We have fellows there as well. Yeah, there's a whole, you know, the whole mm. prenatal diagnosis concept and all the new genetic testing uh, that's coming out. It's just a, it seems like a whole new area, a whole new arena. Well, that's something that's going to change, I think, dramatically in the next 18 to 24 months uh, when the economics of that uh, get straightened out. We're going to see major changes in prenatal diagnosis. How do you see it? Well, how do you see it going? Well, you know, if I were to bet, um, I would see that um, uh, an expansion of non-invasive uh, genetic testing, obviously from uh, DNA and maternal blood, fetal DNA. 
because that data is beginning to look very, very good with 99% accuracy, sensitivity, specificity. And um, whether or not that will replace uh, amniocentesis, replace uh, nuchal screening and you know integrated screening first and second trimester, or be an adjunct, uh, how it's going to sort out uh, remains to be seen, and probably dictated by a lot of factors, including the economics. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's going to play a major role in any event, uh, and um, uh, it's too powerful a test not to. I think the cost is going to have to come down, but it's going to be a real game changer. It's really, it's really interesting, and, and the impact it could have on maternal fetal mm -hmm. medicine if it really moves into more of a uh, peripheral blood DNA sort of screening. It's tremendous, incredible. tremendous impact. And it's something that we've been looking for for 20, 25 years. And, and now it's just really come to the fore. I mean, just in the last six months, well, in it just last this current month and last month, several papers, <coughs> both in uh, uh, the Green Journal as well as the American Journal of OBGYN, they're just uh, very exciting things are going on. Well, you know, it's, it's obvious in, in talking with you, and you've had a wonderful career, uh, and have had opportunities in lots of different areas, and have been a great teacher and a mentor, and God, I hate to ha hesitate to even think of how many residents you've, you've trained. But if you had it to do over again, would you do it the same? Would you, would you look to do anything any differently? Well, I don't know. If I'd been born rich, I might have. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, most of us but, don't aren't there, so but I had a work rule that one out. Yeah, no, I, seriously, no. I I would do the same thing. I, you know, my wife and I talk about this all the time. How fortunate we've been uh, to have enjoyed uh, a career, have a good family, and and how many people uh, can, can say that? All those uh, types of things. So it's I wouldn't do anything any differently. Uh, but I would do it twice as long if I could have 150 years. I might work longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not so sure the younger generations would agree with the, with your with your with your, with your last well, statement. It's a different it's a different uh, breed. Yeah. <laughs> well, but it's it's all okay having right. younger you know daughters myself. Well, in having this interview, Bob, it's just wonderful because you have been such a leader in OBGYN, a leader in maternal fetal medicine and the legacy that you have created here in San Diego at UCSD is something that you know, is admired by all. And it's a real pleasure that for ACOG uh, to have had you as part of our organization and how much we have benefited uh, from your assistance and your insight. And now we're benefiting from your daughter's uh, insight and work. And so we really thank you and congratulate you on, on, on your career that's still continuing. And thank you for being able to come and join us this afternoon for this interview. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure, and I'm <clears throat> so pleased to have been invited to share some thoughts with you. And maybe we'll have to share some on the golf course down going so, forward. As soon as you're ready. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>